Old Yeller, Chapter 6 Till little Arliss got us mixed up in that bear fight, I guess I'd been looking on him about like most boys look on their little brothers. I liked him all right, but I didn't have a lot of use for him. What with his always playing in our drinking water and getting in the way of my chopping axe and howling his head off and chunking me with rocks when he got mad, it didn't seem to me like he was hardly worth the bother of putting up with. But that day... When I saw him in the spring so helpless against the angry she-bear, I learned different. I knew then that I loved him as much as I did Mama and Papa, maybe in some ways even a little bit more. So it was only natural for me to come to love the dog that saved him. After that, I couldn't do enough for old Yeller. What if he was a big, ugly, meat-stealing rascal? What if he did fall over and yell bloody murder every time I looked crossways at him? What if he had run off when he ought to have helped with the fighting bulls? None of that made a lick of difference now. He'd pitched in and saved little Arliss when I couldn't possibly have done it, and that was enough for me. I petted him and made over him till he was wiggling all over to show how happy he was. I felt mean about how I'd treated him and did everything I could to let him know. I searched his feet and pulled out a long mesquite thorn that had been embedded between his toes. I held him down and had Mama hand me a stick with a coal fire on it so I could burn off three big bloated ticks that I found inside one of his ears. I washed him with lye soap and water, then rubbed salty bacon grease into his hair all over to rout the fleas. And that night after dark, when he sneaked into bed with me and little Arliss, I let him sleep there and never said a word about it to Mama. I took him and little Arliss squirrel hunting the next day. It was the first time I'd ever taken little Arliss on any kind of hunt. He was such a noisy pest that I always figured he'd scare off the game. As it turned out, he was just as noisy and pesky as I'd figured. He'd follow along, keeping quiet like I told him, till he saw maybe a pretty butterfly floating around in the air. Then he'd set up a yell you could have heard a mile off and go chasing after the butterfly. Of course, he couldn't catch it but he would keep yelling at me to come help him. Then he'd get mad because I wouldn't and yell still louder. Or maybe he'd stop to turn over a flat rock. Then he'd stand yelling at me to come back and look at all the yellow ants and centipedes and crickets and stinging scorpions that were scurrying away, hunting new hiding places. Once he got hung up in some briars and yelled till I came back to get him out, Another time, he fell down and struck his elbow on a rock and didn't say a word about it for several minutes until he saw blood seeping out of the cut on his arm. Then he stood and screamed like he was being burnt with a hot iron. With that much racket going on, I knew we'd scare all the game clear out of the country, which I guess we did. All but the squirrels, they took to the trees where they could hide from us. But I was lucky enough to see which tree one squirrel went up, so I put some of little Arliss's racket to use. I sent him in a circle around the tree, beating on the grass and bushes with a stick while I stood waiting. Sure enough, the squirrel got to watching little Arliss and forgot me. He kept turning around the tree limb to keep it between him and little Arliss till he was on my side in plain sight. I shot him out of the tree the first shot. After that, old Yeller caught on to what game we were after. He went to work then, trailing and treeing squirrels that little Arliss was scaring up off the ground. From then on, with Yeller to tree the squirrels and little Arliss to turn them on the tree limbs, we had pickings. Wasn't but a little bit till I'd shot five, more than enough to make us a good squirrel fry for supper. A week later, old Yeller helped me catch a wild gobbler that I'd have lost without him. We had gone up to the corn patch to pick a bait of black-eyed peas. I was packing my gun. Just as we got up to the slab rock fence that Papa had built around the corn patch, I looked over and spotted this gobbler doing our pea picking for us. The pea pods were still green yet, most of them no further along than snapping size. This made them hard for the gobbler to shell, but he was working away at it, pecking and scratching so hard that he was raising a big dust out in the field. Why that old rascal, Mama said. He's clawing those pea vines all to pieces. Hush, Mama, I said. Don't scare him. I lifted my gun and laid the barrel across the top of the rock fence. 
I'll have him ready for the pot in just a minute. It wasn't a long shot, and I had him sighted in, dead to rights. I aimed to stick a bullet right where his wings hinged to his back. I was holding my breath and already squeezing off when little Arliss, who'd gotten behind, came running up. What you shooting at, Travis? He yelled at the top of his voice. What you shooting at? Well, that made me and the gobbler both jump. The gun fired, and I saw the gobbler go down. But a second later, he was up again, streaking through the tall corn, dragging a broken wing. For a second, I was so mad at little Arliss, I could have wrung his neck like a frying chicken's. I said, Arliss, why can't you keep your mouth shut? You made me lose that gobbler. Well, little Arliss didn't have sense enough to know what I was mad about. Right away, he puckered up and went to crying and leaking tears all over the place. Some of them splattered clear down on his bare feet, making dark splotches in the dust that covered them. I always did say that when little Arliss cried, he could shed more tears faster than any crier I ever saw. Wait a minute, Mama put in. I don't think you've lost your gobbler yet. Look yonder. She pointed, and I looked, and there was old Yeller jumping the rock fence, racing toward the pea patch. He ran up to where I'd knocked the gobbler down. He circled the place one time, smelling the ground and wriggling his stub tail. Then he took off through the corn, the same way the gobbler went, yelling like I was beating him with a stick. When he barked treed a couple of minutes later, it was in the woods the other side of the corn patch. We went to him. We found him jumping at the gobbler that had run up a stooping live oak and was perched there, panting, just waiting for me. So in spite of the fact that little Arliss had caused me to make a bad shot, we had us a real sumptuous supper that night. Roast turkey with cornbread dressing and watercress and wild onions that little Arliss and I found growing down in the creek next to the water. But when we tried to feed old Yeller some of the turkey on account of his saving us from losing it, he wouldn't eat. He'd lick the meat and wiggle his stub tail to show how grateful he was, but he didn't swallow down more than a bite or two. That puzzled Mama and me because when we remembered back, we realized he hadn't been eating anything we'd feed him for the last several days. Yet he was fat and with hair as slick and shiny as a dog eating three squares a day. Mama shook her head. If I didn't know better, she said, I'd say that dog was sucking eggs. But I've got three hens sitting and one with bitty chickens, and I'm getting more eggs from the rest of them than I've gotten since last fall. So he can't be robbing the nests. Well, we wondered some about what old Yeller was living on, but didn't worry about it. That is not until the day Buddy Cersei dropped by the cabin to see how we were making out. Bud Cersei was a red-faced man with a bulging middle who liked to visit round the settlement and sit and talk hard times and spit tobacco juice all over the place and wait for somebody to ask him to dinner. I never did have a lot of use for him, and my folks didn't either. Mama said he was shiftless. She said that was the reason the rest of the men left him at home to sort of look after the women folk and kids while they were gone on the cow drive. She said the men knew that if they took Bud Cersei along, They'd never get to Kansas before the steers were dead with old age. It would take Cersei that long to get through visiting and eating with everybody between Salt Licks and Abilene. But he did have a little white-haired granddaughter that I sort of liked. She was 11 and different from most girls. She would hang around and watch what boys did, like showing how high they could climb in a tree, or how far they could throw a rock, or how fast they could swim, or how good they could shoot but she never wanted to mix in or try to take over and boss things. She just went along and watched and didn't say much. And the only thing I had against her was her eyes. They were big, solemn brown eyes and right pretty to look at, only when she fixed them on me, it always seemed like they looked clear through me and saw everything I was thinking. That always made me sort of jumpy, so that when I could, I never would look right straight at her. Her name was Lizbeth and she came with her grandpa the day he visited us. They came riding up on an old shad-bellied pony that didn't look like he'd had a fill of corn in a coon's age. She rode right behind her grandpa's saddle, holding onto his belt in the back, and her white hair was all curly and rippling in the sun. Trotting behind them was a blue-ticked she-dog that I always figured was one of Belle's pups. Old Yeller went out to bathe them as they rode up. 
I noticed right off that he didn't go about it like he really meant business. His yell and bay sounded a lot more like he was just barking because he figured that's what we expected him to do. And the first time I hollered at him, telling him to dry up all that racket, he hushed, which surprised me, as hard-headed as he generally was. Well, I think we're going to pause here and continue with this story in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.